This object has fascinated me my entire life. And it's very strange that all of, you know, the stability of matter and, and matter's strange properties with electron shells are all coming out of this weird knot that appears everywhere in the universe. And it's not universally known that it's even there. Do you think Dirac actually understand, understood these objects, these most mysterious of Two objects? Two component spinners. Spinners in general. I mean, he brought yeah, them into so. physics. Yeah. They'd yeah. been previously found inside of mathematics, I think by people like Killing and Lee, I'm not sure who. Yes. But Cartan was the Cartan, one. perhaps. I don't think, I mean, let me throw out a really dangerous idea. I don't think any of us understand them at all. And the part of the problem was, is that he understood very well what could be said about them. Yeah. But that if, you know, I asked you before about like your favorite film, you said 2001. You could yeah. make an argument that spinners are in mathematics and physics, like the monolith, it's always encountered. Nobody ever understands exactly what it means, but it always grabs your attention because mm -hmm. it seems so absolutely bizarre and highly conserved. Well, I always like to think of things geometrically and uh, at least for the two component ones. You see, when you go up to high dimensions, you still have spinners. But the spinners, the dimension of the spinners goes up exponentially. So each time you add the two to the dimension of the space, and the dimension of the spin is it's multiplied by two. So, they so get, dimension 2D, for example, yeah. you'd get spinners of dimension two to the D over two. Yeah, that's the sort of thing, that's right. And so the, the well, the, usually one talks about the Dirac spinners, which are the four dimension, the four the full, spinners. The right, full, right, right. But they split into these two, two and two. In even dimensions. Yes, that's right, in even dimensions. And, uh, I like to understand these things geometrically. So you could see what the two component spinner represented. I had this picture of a of a flag. So you have the flagpole goes along the light cone. So that's a that's the vector like piece of it. Yeah, it's a vector. A null. And vector. then you have an extra piece of data. An extra piece, which is this flag plane. Mm. And you you get a pretty good geometrical understanding. The one little catch to it is that if you rotate it through Three hundred sixty uh, degrees. So you might think just to where it started. It's not the same as it was before. It's it's changed its sign, and then you rotate it again. So well, that won't make any sense to anyone. <laughs> but if I mean, one way of looking at that is if you have a Klein bottle. And yes. For those of some people will be listening to this in audio, some watching it in video. <laughs> okay. A Klein bottle, in a certain sense, that can be made precise, has a square root that would be a torus, that is yes, a double cover. Right. Yes, yes. So it seems like a very weird thing to take a square root of a strange topological Mobius-like object, mm. but there you are. Yeah. So it's really the square root of the rotations that yeah. has this double effect. But we say it linguistically in a way that makes it almost impossible for anyone to understand. Well, I think this was a mystery. I mean, I understood that a spinner was the square root of a vector, you see, and I couldn't make head or tail of that idea. And it was when I went to Dirac's course, it did become clear. And he made he gave this very Im impressive illustration, which I thought was due to Dirac. I learned later it was due to Hermann Weyl. Mm. But you imagine a cone, circular mm. cone, so yes. in space like that, circular cross section, and another equal cone, which rolls on it. So one is fixed, and the other one rolls around on it. Now, you see, when you imagine initially, the cone is almost a, uh, just a little spike. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a tiny circle at the end. And when you roll one on the other, it's like rolling one coin on the other coin. So, and you can see, when you roll one coin on another coin, it goes around twice. It goes it, it, 720 degrees as you go around. Okay. Now, when, then you imagine gradually increasing the angle, the semi-angle of the cone. And you do it again. You keep thinking of that motion until it becomes almost flat. So it's, and then what's the other one? It's just a little wobble. Right. So when it becomes flat, this motion goes to nothing. So this illustrates how a rotation through 4 pi, right. two complete rotations, gradually can be deformed into no rotation at all. However, with single rotation, it doesn't disappear. Well, I think with a 
With a pulley system and a wheel, we don't have any trouble imagining a wheel that rotates twice as fast, half as fast, not okay. at all, hooked up to one particular crank wheel, right? Yes. The problem comes when um, that that's not the generic case. The generic case is usually encountered one dimension higher, three and up, has a familiar because something called well, the fundamental need, group has its structure of Z mod yeah. two, yeah. Um, rather than least, Z yes. in, in dimension two. So there is something where in the place where you can see this most easily, it's slightly misleading. And then in higher dimensions, you have to learn how to tutor your intuition, which is this problem that all of us who try to think about higher dimensional objects encounter is that we have to use the visual cortex we're handed and then we have to trick it into imagining worlds beyond where we've seen. But you see, Dirac had another thing that I'd... Uh, there's a thing called the Dirac scissors problem. Mm. So you imagine a chair with which has the um, pieces of wood going up like this, yeah. and you have a, a pair of scissors. I think this is Dirac's joke that it was a pair of scissors. And through the, the, uh, the where you put your fingers, you have a piece of string which goes through this and then goes around the chair and then comes back through the other one and goes back again. Right. Now the problem is you take the scissors and you rotate them through 360, 360 degrees and the strings all tangled up. You can't untangle Whatever it. you do, you can't untangle it. You're allowed to move the scissors around parallel, not right. rotate them. And you can move the string around it and you can't undo it. But you do twice, 300, 720 degrees, two complete rotations. And then you find you can un untangle it. So this was the Dirac scissors problem. And I think the, the, tr the joke was it's a pair of scissors. So if you get so frustrated, you, you, you just, just cut, cut the, the string. Yes. Yeah. And he wrote a paper explaining that, I think Max Newman yeah. wrote a paper. Dirac did this as an illustration of how you can undo it when it's, when it's right. four pi, or for 720 degrees. But to prove that you couldn't do it with this is i think you, okay well, max newman had a have you seen this video called air on the dirac string which illustrates this in video form oh, i haven't seen the. i would highly recommend it because it, it it shows this yeah. off as the similarity <laughs> to the belt trick to the philippine yes. wine glass yes, dance the is, all yeah, of the these different is, versions yeah i find i could do that one actually <laughs> yes i had joe rogan try it and he, i think he got almost all the way around yeah no i i've, I've done it with a glass with yeah. water yes you go like that and it comes back very stylish. Yes. Um, so you can do two two complete rotations. Two complete rotations. Yes. So this is a, this is a very fundamental property mm. of the world that is somehow not discussed. I think I find it very interesting that people want to talk to me about the multiverse. Sometimes they want to talk to me about quantum measurement problems. But the idea that we are somehow based on a square root, and I would disagree with you slightly if you would permit it, <laughs> that it's not just a question of the square root of the space of the vectors, it's the square root of the the algebra generated by the vectors mm -hmm. that really the, the spinners are, this exterior or Clifford algebra. Oh yeah. This object has fascinated me my entire life, and it's very strange that all of, you know, the stability of matter and, and matter's strange properties yeah. with electron shells are all coming out of this weird knot that it appears everywhere in the universe, and it's not universally known that it's even there. Yeah, I suppose the difference between the fermions and the bosons, so the particles which have a spin which is half an odd number, right? which, which have this curious property that you rotate them and they get back to minus themselves. And it's crucial for, for matter because the Pauli exclusion principle depends on the the Fermi statistics, which is to do with the this exact this property. So without this knottedness and the scissor trick or whatever you want to call it, yeah. we wouldn't have a periodic table and we, chemical elements. You that, wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't which, have anything. Yeah, you wouldn't have it. You wouldn't have fermions. In other words, you wouldn't have things which have an exclusion principle. So and the bosons, which uh, are the opposite, they they like to be on. The, if you have two bosons. Uh, in, you can have them in the same state. They rather like to be in the same state. <laughs> so you get these things called Bose-Einstein condensates, where if you get them very cold, they all flop together into the same state. But for the fermions, it's completely the opposite. They hate to be in the same state, or they can't be. And this is what sort of pushes them apart. So you get the Fermi principle 
So you have this, this, this strange thing called the spin statistics theorem yes. Yes. that says that if things have a knottedness of a particular kind, then they either are highly individualistic or highly communistic, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. My question would be, there's another aspect of that that I've been very curious about, which is when we have to treat these objects quantum mechanically, and you've of course thought a great deal oh, about yeah? quantum yeah, theory, be, yeah. we have two totally different prescriptions for how to make these different objects quantum mechanical, but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two utterly different treatments that matter and force get quantum mechanically. It's the darndest thing. Yeah. When you get these two kinds of particle or two kinds of atoms, the bosons and the fermions, and it has to do with the, make a complete rotation. Do they come back to themselves or do they come back to minus themselves? That's the topological yes. bit. Yeah. But then there's this whole thing well, that might go under oh, you sure. know, like Berezin uh, integration, which is no integration at all. I mean, you're, you're effectively almost lying about what sure. you're doing to the fermions yes. to make them look like bosons. Yeah. And yet, what we, what we seem to get out of this is that nobody, I, I don't think anyone could have anticipated that there would be a dictionary of two totally different structures which are, yeah. seems to be almost word for word. Yeah.